Hey folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to another one of our Guides to Kerbal Space Program for Complete Beginners. And today, I have a very odd contraption here, because I want to demonstrate something. Today, we are going to be learning about planes in Kerbal Space Program. And we are, we're not going to do the single stage to orbit stuff, we're going to be doing planes that exist within the atmosphere over here. Now, planes are super cool by themselves, but planes also have one specific mechanical advantage over rockets. Over here, what I have on the left is a standard fuel tank with the swivel engine, the same thing that we've been using all along. On the right is a jet engine. This is the Weasley jet engine. It's got a single fuel tank over here, and then this is the air intake because uh, jet engines need to breathe oxygen. Even though the fuel tank on the right is considerably smaller than the fuel tank on the left, it's actually only got half the capacity, although it's only filled with liquid fuel and no oxidizer. Um, you can see here, there's a dramatic difference to how much fuel, even though both of these are running, this is running here, it doesn't, you know, shoot fire out the back, but it is shooting some air. Even though they're both running, and even though they actually have similar thrust, we know that our swivel engine has a thrust rating of, what is it, like 168 kilonewtons? The Weasley engine is 120, so the Weasley engine's got a little less thrust, but it's in the same ballpark. Look at the difference in fuel consumption between the two. This one drinks fuel like it's going out of style, and this one here is barely sipping in its fuel tank. Most likely, this fuel, the fuel in this, um, this tank over here, could probably run this engine for like an hour or more, whereas the fuel on the left is going to last no more than maybe a total of one minute or something like that. So a pretty substantial performance difference, and that's why planes are cool. Now, oftentimes, um, these engines, now in this case, this engine actually would be powerful enough to send us upwards at 120 kilonewtons. If I were to go and just stage us over here like this, um, well, we're going sideways. Actually, it's not. It's not hitting its full thrust because its peak thrust is 120. Right now, it's thrusting considerably less than that because its thrust is actually limited. Jet engines get more thrust the faster they go because the faster a jet is moving, the more air is coming in through the intake, so the more powerful it gets up to a certain point. There's, there are different calculations there. But actually, that was a pretty interesting example in that that jet didn't seem to be giving us enough thrust to take off. So how do planes take off at all? Well, the secret is that planes don't take off straight up via thrust. They actually gain most of their upwardness. Oh, um, I guess we'll recover that. Uh, I guess maybe I would have wanted to revert. Oh, Jebediah is still alive, so it's fine. Uh, planes get their upward movement via wings. Wings are actually the things that move us upwards. In a plane, the jet is only responsible for making us push sideways. We're just trying to move sideways, and the wings are doing the job of lifting us up, which works great and is super fuel efficient. So in research and development over here, um, what you need for today's tutorial is you need to have unlocked aviation over here. I've also unlocked aerodynamics, which gave me access to the Weasley engine, just for that demo because they were the same size. But we're actually not going to use the Weasley engine in this particular video. We're only going to concern ourselves with the parts that you basically get from unlocking aviation. We're going to make a very simple plane, but something that's going to be really useful for collecting research from a variety of different biomes. So if we go into the space plane hangar, the space plane hangar is exactly the same as the vehicle assembly building, except instead of building vertically, you build horizontally. Also, when we hit the launch button, you are going to launch from the runway instead of the launch pad. Those are the two the only two real differences between the space plane hangar and the vehicle assembly building. There is another difference with symmetry that we'll look at in a second. Now, while you can 100% totally make a plane with the Mark 1 command pod, we're going to go with the Mark 1 cockpit. Primary reason we're going with the Mark 1 cockpit is because it looks way cooler. It looks more airplane like. But really, there are two true reasons to do it. One, it's more aerodynamic. With the Mark 1 command pod, you really have to go and add some sort of nose cone or something like that if you want aerodynamicness. Also, the Mark 1 cockpit can withstand an impact of up to 40 meters per second, as opposed to the 14 from the Mark 1 command pod. So it's actually quite common for you on landings maybe to maybe accidentally bump the nose over here, and it becomes a little bit more safe and sturdy to do it that way. On the other hand, this is a heavier cockpit than the Mark 1 command pod, so there is something to be said about that. Okay, how do we make our plane go? Well, our plane for this, just very much like with our um, with our other vessels, we probably want to bring some sort of stuff with us. So let's assume 
there's going to be some stuff going on here. Let's assume, oh, we're going to want to do science things. So we're going to want, I don't know, uh, a science junior over here. Um, and then we'll, I don't know, we'll throw in a, I don't know, a goo pod on the top, uh, press mat barometer over here and maybe a thermometer, I don't know, right on the nose. There, we've got all our science. That's great. Not only that, uh, maybe we'll want to play a tour guide. So we're going to want to go and um, what am I looking for here? Uh, not you, although you're, you're fine and cool. Do we not have, maybe we don't have it. I thought we had the two passenger. I might have just missed it, but I guess not. Oh, okay. Well then, that that's fine. There we go. So th this is going to be our payload over here. That's going to be okay. Uh, maybe you know what? Just just for the sake of of whatever, because it'll look cool and let us talk about more. We're going to drop a handful of these um, these payload bays on here. These are things that just open up and you can stick stuff inside. Whatever. Just so that I have an excuse for you know having having stuff going on. So we've got that. Now, how do we make us go? Now, if we were designing a rocket, we would just you know stick a big fuel tank on the back of this, and then, you know, one of our rocket engines. And as we know, this would push us very fast, but would burn through this fuel in probably around a minute, which isn't what we're looking for. Instead, we want to make sure we use one of our rocket engines. Now, in this tutorial, we're going to look at the Juno basic rocket engine, but you can also unlock the Weasley, which is considerably more powerful. What's interesting about the Juno, it only has a thrust of 20 kilonewtons. 20 is nothing, very weak thrust, and yet it's going to be more than enough to get us in the air and flying for a very, very, very long time. So we need to stick this engine on somewhere. Now, this looks a little funny, right? The Juno engine is kind of tiny. There's no reason this can't work, okay? It looks silly, but it can work. The Weasley happens to be one and a quarter size, so it looks better, um, but either one will work perfectly fine. The one downside is to get a jet engine to work, you need to feed it air. Rockets, right, if we put a rocket fuel tank on here, this rocket fuel tank contains both liquid fuel and an oxidizer. Because jet en or rocket engines are designed to burn in space where there's no air, you have to bring your own oxidizer with you to cause things to burn. Jet engines do not use oxidizer. In fact, they can't use oxidizer except for the rapier engine, which we'll show in a little bit here. Um, but generally speaking, jet engines can't burn oxidizer. They can only breathe in air. The upshot, though, is that your rockets, how does a rocket work in space? A lot of people get, you know, don't, it's not one of these things that come intuitive because you think that to move, you've got to push against something. And in space, there's nothing to push against. And for some people, thought space travel would be impossible because of that. But it's very simply one of the Newton's, Newton's laws of motions. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The way a jet, a rocket engine works is it works by shooting stuff out the back. You shoot stuff out the back and move forward. Same thing if you're sit, if you're standing on a really slippery icy surface with a brick in your hands and you, you throw the brick out in one direction, you're going to get pushed and slide in the opposite direction. Because when you push against the brick, the brick pushes back against you is one way to think about it. And so a regular rocket engine it burns the fuel to make, you know, bunch, basically like a bunch of little explosions. But the explosions are only happening to cause the rest of all the exhaust to get shoved out the back. It's that shoving of the exhaust out the back that actually moves us forward. So the vast majority of the actual mass of your fuel here isn't really used to produce the combustion. It's mostly so that we have something to shoot out the back of our jet engine. That's why these are not very fuel efficient. On the other hand, or out of the back of a rocket engine. On the other hand, when you've got an actual jet engine, like the Weasley or the Juno, what it's basically doing is it's taking in a bunch of air and it's burning fuel. And the fuel is like spinning a bunch of fans and doing a bunch of crazy stuff in there. But you're not shooting fuel out the back. You're not shooting exhaust out the back to make yourself moving forward. Most of what you're, sho you're shoving out the back is just the air that you just breathed in. So you're breathing in the air, accelerating it a whole bunch, shooting out the back, and that's why you move forward. And that's why a little fuel goes a really long way with jet engines. Now, you could stick a jet engine on the back of this thing, that'd be fine. Again, if you right click on the, the fuel tank, we don't need oxidizer to make the engine go. So we can actually ignore it. What we could do, if you click down here, get the engineer's report so we see our mass, right? Right now we're at 7.8 tons. If I take all this oxidizer out, we are now going to be at 5.6 tons. We just saved 2.2 tons of weight 
just by not bringing oxidizer with us, which is amazing. Now, we can actually do slightly better than that because under your fuel tanks, you actually will have access now to the Mark Zero and Mark One liquid fuel fuselage, they call it. But it's a fuel tank that only contains liquid fuel and is a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. And that's all you need to make your jet engine, which is super cool. Now, again, we need an air intake. We need to breathe in air to make this work. Right now, okay, right now I actually have access to the radial air intake, but you might not, depending on what techs you've got unlocked. Let me just bop out of this for a second. Um, we're gonna, yeah, sure, we'll save you. I guess we saved you as untitled. Okay, that's fine, no worries. Um, if you have only aviation unlocked, then we, you will have access only to the Juno engine and to the small circular intake. If you have unlocked aerodynamics, then you will also have un unlocked the Weasley turbofan engine, as well as the normal sized intake, as well as the radial air intake. So what we could do with this plane is we could put an engine on the back, right? So let's say we put a Weasley on there. Then to take in air, we could use these radial air intakes. It's huge, right? I can put it up here. And this is just a giant scoop to suck in air. <gasps> That's all it does is suck in air and feed it in. It can be anywhere on your ship. You could, you could put it on the front. You could put it on the bottom. It doesn't matter where it is. If you, you know, there's, there's piping that'll bring it to your engine and get the whole thing going on. So this will work. This engine here will breathe, will take in fuel from here, breathe in from here, shoot it out the back. That'll be okay. But I want to um, just use the Juno engines. I want to assume we don't have this tech unlocked. I want to scale it back and say, all we have access to for this tutorial is going to be the Juno basic jet engine and more importantly, we only have access to the small circular intake for the purpose of this tutorial. And this air intake cannot be stuck on the side, can't be mounted radially, radially. It has to be mounted sort of like linearly in a row and it has to have access to air. Like we can't just stick it inside one of these boxes. It's gotta be able to breathe in air. If we were using the Mark I command pod, we actually could stick this in front of the Mark I command pod, which would be pretty good, but we can't stick it in front of this thing here. So instead we're gonna go with a slightly more interesting layout. I'm gonna leave this big fuel tank here, cause sure, why not? But then I'm gonna do something that looks awesome. I'm gonna take the Mark Zero liquid fuel tanks, which are smaller. I'm gonna turn on symmetry mode here, and I'm gonna stick them on top. Now it's worth noting the other big difference between the space plane hangar and the vehicle assembly building is by default, the space plane hangar is in mirror symmetry mode, right? So if I click here, we don't go through like dual symmetry, triple, quadruple, etc. symmetry mode. There's only two. There's either single or double. And that's because it's also in mirrored mode. If I middle click on this, I go into our normal symmetry mode, the same as you've been using before. And if I do that, let's say I take these engines off and then I put this engine back on, it's gonna be mirror, it's gonna be symmetry across the middle, right? This is how you tend to build your rockets in this symmetry mode, the radial symmetry mode. So when you put, put things in, it puts it just on the opposite side. Whereas in mirrored symmetry mode, whoops, by middle clicking over here, mirrored symmetry mode, it cuts it through the plane this way, like the actual, you know, X, Y, Z kind of plane this way and mirrors it on the opposite side, which tends to be what you want for planes. So let's go, let's say we stick, I don't know, this over here uh, no, here, like this. That looks cool. I don't know. doesn't matter. And we throw a couple of Juno engines on the back of that. Oops. And then these have to breathe. So we're going to go ahead and put the small circular intake like that. I mean, it's starting to look kind of cool. What do we need? Obviously, we're going to need some wings. So um, I have a handful unlocked. Uh, you will, the very first wing I think you will unlock is a swept wing, so we will use that. But there are a variety of different wing options. So I'm going to click these swept wings and I put them somewhere. Where? I don't know, should they be fo more forward? In fact, I'm going to put them a little bit more forward and hope that it's a mistake. It might not be. I'm, it might work out that it's not a mistake. But I'm kind of crossing my fingers and hoping that it will be an error to put the wings up here. We'll see. Then what are we going to need? Well, you know that planes have that like the little stabilizer, the little tail fin, and the rudder back here. So maybe we want something like that. Let's say, for the sake of argument, I mean, we could do it with the basic fins. I'm gonna go ahead and use these winglets. 
You'll note there's also this thing actually called the tail fin. We'll talk about that later. But we're going to use these tail fins because they, they, you know, they look, they look kind of cool, right? Yeah, I know they look cool. Let's let's have them not stick out past there, just for cosmetic purposes. So we'll do that. Then I'm going to grab another one. I'm going to turn off symmetry mode, and we're going to do something like this. I mean, this is looking kind of plain like. Spoiler alert. This plane is missing a couple of critical things and also may have the wings in the completely wrong uh, location, but we're going to find that out soon. Um, obviously, if we were to try to take off like this, we'd have a bit of a problem. Mostly, we'd ruin the paint, the paint job on the bottom of our plane. We need some wheels. So we're going to go into the ground bits over here. And we have access to... Um, well, we have access to our landing struts, but we don't want that because those are just feet. That's what we use to land on Minmus. We have access to fixed landing gear steerable landing gear, and just this retractable small landing gear. The fixed landing gear works very simply. You just attach it to the side of your ship, let's turn on a symmetry mode, and you know, they roll. You can't, you can't bring them in or anything. They're getting uh, put on upside down here, right, quite clearly. And how do you fix that? Well, we haven't talked about it before, but if you use the WASD, Q and E thing, so W and S, a and D, as well as Q and E, you can actually like rotate these parts around before you put them on your vessel. Okay, and you can, um, there we go. You can rotate them the right way to get down there. That can sometimes be a little tricky to get exactly right. Let me just reset them. Let's say I try to put them on here, right? And things are clearly not facing the right way. And using all those WASD keys, which one's the right one? I don't know. We've got these four tools over here we've never really showcased including the rotate tool. If you click on this and then click on a part, you get this little widget here that allows you to rotate the part around. So let's say I start, I'm going to grab the orange bit and spin that right around, baby, so that the, you know, the tire part of the wheel is facing downwards. There we go. That's looking better. And then let's grab maybe the blue part over here and flare it out. All of a sudden, we kind of have wheels that feel right. I like it. Um, and then we could do the same thing. We could take these guys and put them in the front as well, make something that sort of looks car-like. But these are fixed landing gear. They don't let you steer. They don't do anything. If we take this steerable landing gear, and we're just going to want a single one, and we stick it, say, on the front over here, this thing, when, you, when, you're, when you're actually piloting your, your vessel out there and you use the A and D key to go left and right, this wheel will actually turn. And this is the best way to steer on the ground. Should we give this a go? I'm, I, there's still something very important missing from this plane, but I'm just very curious to see what would happen if we enable this. So let's see what goes on, okay? So, do, 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 there we are. So we're here, okay? If our plane was too heavy, it's possible these wheels wouldn't be able to cut it. They seem to be all right. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to full throttle. I mean, hit space bar to light our engines. Now, these engines lit, and you can right-click on them and see status, nominal, that's good. They, you might have had a, uh, a flare-out. If you forgot the air intake, Nothing would happen. You get a bunch of sparks and nothing would happen. So what's going to happen here is we're going to try to stay a little bit more centered. We got the SAS on, but Jebediah doesn't do a great job. Um, why aren't we leaving the ground? Well, oh, well, we left the ground a little bit, and then horrible things are going to happen. We steer our rockets through a combination of two things. Let's revert to the space plane hangar. Our rockets that are going up steer somewhat from reaction wheels, which we do have on this ship, but mostly, as we know, it has to steer using um, engine thrust, vectored thrust, engines that have a gimbling uh, value, okay? That's mostly how we steer our rockets. Um, but even those, they don't steer very quickly, okay? You can't change the direction of the rocket that quickly. Um, and our plane here does have access to reaction wheels, although we don't have gimbling engines. Uh, you do kind of get some later, but that doesn't, that's not going to be really functional. And on the ground, we can steer using this front wheel. But to actually, you know, steer up, down, left, right, and roll when we're in the air, we have to go and change how the air is smacking into our plane for that to work. And for that, we need control surfaces. And none of these wings or um, tail fins or rudder currently have any control surfaces. They have no ability, like, you know, Jebediah, he's in the front here, he's got his joystick, but it doesn't matter what he does, our wings aren't sort of changing their shape, which means we can't affect the flow of air over our wings, which isn't very good. So we've got a couple options for that. Under aerodynamics, we've got these things called elevons. 
and as you unlock more tech, you'll get more and more variants of them, but you should have the Elevon one right here. If we click on this, we know there should be little thingies on our wings over here. We're gonna go and put on symmetry mode. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna click here, then I'll go into the rotation tool and just get them to look sensible. So we're gonna get the, the fat edge is pointing forward and the thin edge, the trailing edge is hanging back. So now all of a sudden we've got something that when Jebediah, you know, uses his, his uh, the joystick here, he's going to be able to like raise these up and down to do things, which is going to give him some amount of air control. Now we want some of those on the wings. The ones on the wings are actually most responsible for rolling the plane. In addition to that, we want some amount of control surfaces on the, uh, the tail as well as the rudder so that we can control pitch and yaw. You did, you're gonna get a little bit of pitch control from this, but mostly you're gonna get it from the back. The problem is this winglet doesn't actually give us the ability to attach the elevons to. Um, now there's a few different things you could do to get that sorted out, but by far one of the best things to do is probably just to grab this thing called the tail fin. And what's interesting about this tail fin is that it actually has an area here that tells you that it has a control surface, right? If we take a look at the wing, the wing is a lifting surface. The winglet is also technically a lifting surface, but the tail fin is a control surface and 100% of it is a control surface over here, which is the same as the Elevon. So if we use this thing called the tail fin, this thing here, the entire thing actually tilts and, and, and twists and, and things like that based on our inputs, which is exactly what we're looking for. We're gonna get another tail fin, turn off symmetry mode and stick it over here. So now we're gonna have a lot more control over what we can do with our plane. Now we're still gonna have a problem where this plane is gonna be nearly uncontrollable on the ground, I suspect. We're gonna find out in just a second, but I probably we're gonna run into that problem and that's good. I actually want our design to run into as many problems as possible so that we can answer questions when you guys have it. Now, before I turn on the engines, I'm gonna use A and D to go left and right. And you can see this whole tail fin, this rudder, moves as well as your front wheel so that's cool if i use w and s for up and down you can see these control surfaces tilt and change for that that's great and if i use q and e to roll we're going to see some more twisting motion over there we may want to turn some of those off but we'll see how it goes i'm going to turn on sas full throttle and go i still suspect when we hit about 30 meters a second or something like that our plane might go sideways in a bit of an uncontrollable fashion i'm not going to hit any keys we'll see yeah, see, it's starting to drift and Jebediah is trying to use SAS to keep us going straight. He's having a bit of a hard time. It looks like he's gonna do okay. You know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold S to tip up. What happened? What happened? Why did we go crazy? As soon as I hit S, we tried to pull up, but we pulled up way too much. Was it because I held S too long? Maybe a little bit, but no, at a certain point, I, even after I let go, I didn't mean to recover, I meant to revert. Uh, I guess it's fine. Jebediah's still alive. We'll have wasted the money. There might still be some debris around. Nope. Okay. Um, even after I let go, the plane kept trying to backflip. And I'm going to tell you why. Spoiler alert. It's because our plane, our wings are too far forward. Why is that? What's going on? We're going to turn on two really helpful indicators here for our plane design. The first is the center of mass overlay. This shows you the center of your mass of your plane which is often going to be most heavily influenced by where your fuel is. Your fuel is one of the heaviest things in your plane. So that's why the center of mass is kind of towards the rear of the plane over here. This is basically the point around which the plane will pivot because it's the center of mass. By the way, if your wheels here, if your back wheels are in front of the center of mass, that will cause your, as soon as you try to launch and you like, you know, you, you hit this, this launch button and you spawn on the runway, as soon as that happens, your tail will go and like, smack onto the ground because your your center of mass is behind your wheels. So you want you always want your wheels to be behind the center of mass over here so you don't tip backwards. You don't want it too far back because if it is, it's gonna be too hard for you to actually like pitch up and leave the runway. So you want them to be behind the center of mass, but usually not too much. The other thing we can turn on is this very important button called aerodynamic overlay. And what this will do is this is gonna show us the center of lift. Right, our wings, as well as the, the tail to a certain extent and various things like this. But these are this is producing a certain amount of lift. Uh, it's partially a factor of its shape, partially a factor of the angle at which it hits the air. But these wings are trying to lift us up. The faster we go forward, the faster we go forward, the more the wings are lifting us up. 
And the problem here, and why our plane did a backflip upon taking off from the ground, is that the lifting force of the wing, which is represented by this blue line, is in front of the center of mass. So think about our plane. When we want to steer our plane, um, right, we are going to, if we want our plane to go up, we're going to want to pitch up like this. Oh, let me turn off snapping so I've got more control here, right? When we want to go up, we're going to want to pitch up our plane like this. And because of the angle of the wind hitting the plane, uh, the wing here, the wind, you know, we're moving into the air, so you can sort of think of it as, as the air is moving into us, right? When we move into the air, it moves into us. As I've said before, if you're driving in a car and you stick your hand out the window, it'll feel like the wind is pushing your hand backwards, whereas in fact, your vehicle is moving forward into the wind. But it's the same thing here, right? As we pitch up and the wind hits the bottom of the wing here, right, it wants to lift us up more. Or if we were to pitch down, the wind is gonna hit sort of the top of the wing and, and push us down further. I'm very much approximating how these things are working out. But basically, that's it, right? If, if the wind is going from right to left and we're aiming downwards like this, the wind is going to hit the top of this with the wing and push us downwards and, and vice versa. This is the angle attack. And again, I'm fudging a lot of aerodynamics, but I mean, that's the gist of it. Point up, go up. Point down, go down. Done. Because our center of lift is in front of the center of mass, when our wing naturally tries to raise the airplane off the ground because that's what wings do because it's in front of the center of mass the front of our plane is going to rise first which means we're pitching up which means the wind is going to hit beneath our wings and try to push us up more which is going to cause us to pitch up more which is going to cause the wind to hit this which is going to cause us to do this and woo and everyone's dead very bad undo 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 instead if I grab the place tool and I make sure I'm in symmetry and toggle snap, if I take this wing and I move it backwards until such point as the blue line is just behind the center of mass, okay, or any amount behind the center of mass, right? Let's say, whatever, let's say I take this and I send it way back. Uh, I can even, it's a little tricky to attach it to these little components, but I do that, right? So that's clearly behind the center of mass. Now what's gonna happen? Now, as our wings try to lift us, Right, what's gonna happen is it's gonna lift the back first, which is gonna do this. Then the wind's gonna be coming this way, hitting the top of the wing, forcing the wings back down. So the wings wanna go up, but the aerodynamic forces is gonna try to force the wings down, and it's gonna encourage us to be stable. Same thing, if for any reason we're, we're ending up like this, the wind is gonna hit the bottom part of the wing, which is gonna push the wing up, and again, try to keep us stable. This is the same reason when you build a rocket, you put your fins at the back of the rocket, because that way, when the fins are at the back of the rocket, all the aerodynamic forces are trying to keep the rocket facing the direction of your movement. If you were, for some reason, to put your in your rocket, right, when you're building a rocket, if you put your fins at the front of the rocket, then they would do exactly what this plane just did, and they would cause you to backflip right away. Wings and, and things like that at the back of your plane cause you to be stable. They cause your plane or your rocket to point in the direction that you're moving in. Whereas if you put these these various aerodynamic forces or surfaces at the front of your plane of your rocket or your plane, they will cause you to backflip because again, they naturally want to be at the back of everything. So by moving our wing backwards, we end up with a more stable plane over here. You want your center of lift to be behind your center of mass and everything will work out awesome. How much further back? Ultimately, it doesn't matter. The further back it is, the more stable your plane will be. If it's too far back, you might find that it's too sluggish to turn, um, or it's possible you'll, you'll end up being too nose heavy. But that's sort of trial and error. It's going to be based on the weight of your plane, the thrust you've got to play with, how fast you're going to travel, um, and a few different things like that. There'll be different sweet spots um, in terms of maneuverability and stability. Um, keep in mind, one of the important things is as you start to run out of fuel, so if I click on this fuel tank, oh, no, sorry, that's not what I meant to do at all. If I right click on this fuel tank and I drain the fuel, you'll see the center of mass moves, right? Because we get, we no longer have as much weight in the back. Now here it's gonna be fine because as we drain fuel, we're actually gonna become more and more and more stable. If our fuel tank was near the front of our plane, then keep in mind that as we burn fuel, our center of mass will move backwards, which might move it behind the center of lift. Here, I think that we can probably go and afford to move our, our wings further forward. I'm gonna put them like here. So they're just, just behind the center of mass, still inside of the orb. Again, it, 
adjust to your personal taste. And the nice thing about this is as we burn more fuel, our plane will become more stable. Interesting thing um, with really modern jet fighters, as far as I understand, they're actually sort of designed a little bit backwards, where they're unstable. Their center of lift might actually be in front of their center of mass. That means they can they can turn and flip and be really contro controllable really fast, or might they might be like right on the center of mass. The downside is it's basically impossible for a human to steer it naturally, and so you need computer assistance. Anyway, um, I think we are now at a point where we can take off and fly this bad boy. Let's find out. Also, I really, I think it's super cool looking to having the two jet engines up here. It's so not the only way to do it. You can attach them to the wings. Uh, you could have it underneath. You could have everything designed in line. But I mean, that's cool, right? It's cool. All right. So we're going to go to full, we're going to turn on SAS, go to full throttle, and turn on our engines. Now, there's still a possibility that we'll drift a little bit sideways as we start going here, because um, if your plane is too heavy for your wheels, your wheels tend to get a little bit wonky. Um, but we might... No, there's a little bit of drift, but I'm going to try to pull back here as we turn around 50. Just try to pull up, pull up, pull up. I don't want to pull up too fast, because you can end up with a tail strike. If you, if you pitch up too fast, depending on where your wheels are, you might smack your bottom on the ground. So, you sort of, like... You're going to have to figure out, like, exactly how much S you can give your plane to take off. And usually, as soon as you start to pitch backwards and you start to rise up, you'll often want to hit W a little bit to pitch down right away um, so that you don't smack the tail. Because all you need is a little bit of climb. By the way, if it's not intuitive to you, because W and S, so a lot of people think of W as up and S as down. What you should think of is more of W as forward and S as backwards. And what you're doing with your W is you're pushing... With the W pushes your nose down, and S pulls your nose up. Oh, I think I just stalled our plane. Okay, recovered. Woo! Didn't have quite enough speed to be able to handle that kind of maneuver there. All right, level out so that our speed goes up. So if we're flying level, our speed should generally increase. Of course, if we go down, we'll gain a lot more speed. And if we pull up, well, a little bit of upwards is fine, and in fact, we're still gaining speed here. If we go too much, we'll start to lose some speed, which is sort of what's happening here, but we're pretty good. Okay. Um, felt like I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah, the W... The one thing to think to imagine it is imagine you've got a straight line coming out from the top of your ship, which sort of represents the joystick that the old school planes have. Now they have control yokes, but anyway. Imagine a joystick here, and so W pushes the top of that stick forward, which does this, and S pulls the stop top of the stick backwards, which does this. Now, if your plane is too controllable, if you find that the movements are too extreme and too fast, there's something you can do about that. You can actually right-click on one of your parts, and you can decrease the authority limiter. So now, this the tails at this point are only going to be at 35% strength. So now as I hit this, there it's a little bit less extreme. The other thing that can help is you can tell certain parts to not be involved in certain movers. Like, for example, I would like my tail fin here, this this rudder, I only want it to be used for yaw. So by default, all parts are active for all maneuvers. So I'm going to turn off the pitch and roll on this thing, which is going to help a fair amount of maneuverability. Uh, one of the big ones that helps is I find the rolling over here, which naturally your tail wants to be involved in. I like to turn off the roll on the tail, and I find that it does it does slow down the rate at which you roll, but it tends to make it more controllable. Although, we need to uh, pitch up a little bit so I don't smack into the ocean here. There we go. Let's pitch up a little bit more. Okay, so S and W, up and down. Now, you might think for turning that you would use A and D, left and right. It's sort of, but not really. Let me go. I'm going to hit A real hard. I'm just going to hold down A, and we're going to see what happens. Oh my god, we're all going to die. What's going on here? First of all, can I recover? I'm going to try real hard to recover this. So we get into a bit of a tailspin there. Oh, there we go. I think we've recovered. You don't actually use this rudder for, for turning. Um, there's a little bit of directional change that you can do with it, but that's not really what it's there for, oddly enough. The way you actually turn a plane is by rolling the plane like this, and keep in mind, your wings want to pull you upwards. Well, right now, up is sideways, so this is going to cause you to drift a little bit. But it becomes even more so if you roll and then actually pull up by hitting S. Then that's how you turn. We can turn real fast here. There we go. We've just done a 180, and it worked beautifully. This is actually a really nice plane to fly. So again, I'm going to turn to the side, then I'm going to pull up, and we are very quickly going to do a 180. 
There we are. And I'm going to try to not die by hitting the ocean here. Um, you do use the uh, the rudder in, in coordination with these turns. In fact, called a coordinated turn. Um, because what happens, keep in mind, your wings are pulling you up. So when you're sideways, you don't have any upness anymore. So you're going to start to go down, which is exactly what's happening here. Pull up, pull up. Okay, we're fine. <laughs> so one of the things you can do when you're doing, in a real airplane, when you're doing your bank turn... You actually use your rudder to help try to keep you level to the horizon so you don't lose much altitude. Um, but in practice, this is going to be too tricky to do in, in Kerbal here, so you don't worry about it. But yeah, you, you roll, you pull up, and then you flatten out again, and that's how you change directions in a plane. And that's definitely the way you're going to do it in Kerbal. As your planes get bigger and more powerful and different things, it's possible that if you just go and like pull up as hard as you can, you might actually rip your plane apart. This one is short enough and, and sturdy enough that that's not an issue, but that, that sort of thing could happen. So you might have to like, you know, pull up a little less aggressively or do various things like that just to keep it a little bit more controlled. And again, I have my, my authority limiter down. If I go and like yank this all the way back up to 100, you can actually bring it up to 150. If I try this again, vroom. Oh, I'm actually stalling a little bit. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. I've gone and stalled the plane. So what does stalling do? It's not the same thing as an, stalling an engine. If at some point, okay, we're gonna be fine. If at some point the airflow over your wings um, is insufficient and or like the airflow from like front to back over your wings is insufficient, which can happen if you literally slow down too much, but it can also happen if you find yourself um, being at too much of an angle. So here we're still mostly moving. When I pitched up like that, at the start of that, we are still moving up. See, there's a good example. We just killed our speed. Uh, we are still mostly moving. Come on, can I recover? I don't think I can. Not this time, baby. Nope. We're just revert. Um, we're still moving from right to left, even though my plane was facing straight up. It's that difference of, like, prograde versus direction. And because of that, the movement of the air across the front to the back of my wing, the leading edge to the, uh, the trailing edge, had basically gone to zero, which means my wings weren't wings anymore. They, they, wings are only wings when air is passing over them. And in that situation, air was not passing over them, so they stopped being wings, and instead we became a giant rock falling from the sky. Now, again, I'm going to not pull up here, because I'm intentionally hoping to show this plane maybe getting some instability going forward. It's pretty good. If you end up with a situation where your plane like starts doing yeah, a bunch of that on the runway, that actually forced it to happen. But I can, I can emphasize it a little bit more here. Go. All right. What can happen, at, you know, when you hit maybe 20 or 30 meters per second, is your plane will start going sideways. And if the SAS is on, Jebediah will try to keep like setting you straight again, but often won't be able to handle it. And then something like this will happen. There's a couple of different reasons for it. One thing is you might need to set your wheels a little further back. The further back these wheels are, the more stable you will be. Also, if they're set wider, which you can totally do, if especially if you use the small landing gear here, which are retractable and look really cool. Oops, that's not what I meant to do at all. Undo, undo, thank you. I just wanna grab the wheel, thank you. Um, symmetry mode on, get you out there. All right, if they're nice and wide, you'll be a little bit more stable, but again, further back tends to be better overall. Um, the other thing that can happen is your wheels sort of have a weight limit. I don't think it's listed so much, but some of these, um, can really have some problems with um, with the plane being too heavy, and then you get some really weird behavior. In fact, sometimes you'll like launch, and as soon as your plane hits the runway here, the, the wheels will collapse under it, and your whole thing will crash. Um, so you might need to use bigger wheels or even more of them. Like you can always, um, you could always pair these up, right? Something like that, right? And big planes certainly do do some pretty crazy uh, wheel setups. Um, in this case, we are okay, uh, so that's good. So that's something to check. Uh, what else do I want to talk about? Um, Right, so, jet engines work by breathing in air, okay? They suck in air through their air intakes, and then they burn some fuel to accelerate the air and shoot it out the back of their engines as quickly as possible, and that's how you move. What's interesting is that the faster you go through the air, right, the faster you're moving, and Jebediah is having a little bit of an issue here, the faster you're moving, the faster the air comes in through the front of your engine. In fact, what's kind of interesting here is you can look at the thrust. See how the thrust is actually increasing? As we increase our speed, more air is being fed into our engine, so our engine's working better. 
the faster we go, the better engine. Now at some point, as we go faster, the thrust number will go down, but that's mostly a factor of hitting sort of max speed for your jet engines and, and different things like that. Um, but yeah, your engines work better the faster you go, um, which is mostly relevant when you get into the very high atmosphere, because here's the deal. Right now, we're near the surface. The air is very thick, right? We, we know that when we're doing our rocket launches, right, and we're trying to go up, the first part of the ascent is through thick, thick air, and the air is working to slow us down. And the same thing's true of a plane. If we go too fast, we will start to hit, um, we will start to, to run into problems where we're actually uh, being slowed down by the air. Now, these Juno engines won't tend to hit that, that speed. They don't tend to go fast enough for that to really be a problem. But as you go and start using like the Weasley engines, different things like that, you can actually start going very fast. In fact, it's possible, let me revert this flight here. The Juno engines have a maximum thrust of somewhere around 20. We're using two of them, so that's 40. But if I go and just stick a, uh, a Weasley engine on the back here, this has a thrust of 120. So if I do that, and we have, this may have shifted the center of mass. No, we're still good. Excellent. So we've gone and we just tripled our thrust, right? We went from 40 to 120 at, as a max. So we've got three times the thrust. We might be able to see those aerodynamic forces a little bit more. So let's go. So I'm still using these for the air intakes and a little bit of extra fuel. And this fuel and air is all linked because they're, um, they're not separated by, uh, by stages or anything like that. So they're all flowing into one another. That's going to be fine. So let's go ahead and pitch up here. And I, I'm a little bit longer in the back, so I got to really make sure I don't tail strike. Um, if I did use retractable gear, we'd have a little bit less um, air resistance as well. But there we go. We're getting a lot of speed. That's good. Hopefully you're getting all the air you want. Everything is nominal. Excellent. And so the thrust is higher. It's going down a little bit just because of things, but we're gaining a lot of speed. There we go. So once we start to get around 300 meters per second, we're going to start seeing, see these forces? Actually, it starts to show up at over 200. Um, this is aerodynamic forces. This is drag and also closing in on the sound barrier that we're seeing here. These are aerodynamic forces that are really slowing us down. We're having to push against that thick, thick air. And so as you go higher up in the atmosphere, especially as you cross over 10,000 meters, the air starts to go thinner so it's not slowing you down as more, so you're actually going, you can actually go faster. So as you go higher up, you can go a lot faster. The same, th 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 that is absolutely true with rockets, but it's also true with planes. The downside is, you're going faster because there's less air slowing you down. But if there's less air slowing you down, there's also less air for you to breathe. You can see the, fl the flow over here is going down. So this flow is how much air this is drinking in. That's dropping as we're getting to thinner and thinner air. The faster we go, the more flow there is. So if I level off so that we're increasing our speed again, you can see the flow going up. Oh, we're actually, we're, we're dropping a little bit as well. But if I equalize out our vertical motion, there we go. So we're basically level. Actually, we're still climbing, so the air is getting thinner, and yet the flow is increasing, because despite the fact that the air is getting thinner, we're moving faster. So once you get, and this becomes especially important once you get above 10,000 meters, because the air starts to become thinner, you want to make sure that you maintain enough speed so that your engine, your jet engine is getting enough air. Otherwise, it's going to start to choke and die, and then you'll run out of speed, and then you, you won't be able to do anything. So you need to, like, depending on your design and what engine you use and how much air intake you've got, bigger air, air intakes can suck in more air, there's actually going to be, like, this weird thing where you're going to be golden as long as you're above a certain speed and you'll keep accelerating, but if you drop below a certain speed, then your speed's going to just keep dropping overall. Um, the Juno can operate um, pretty well, can really has kind of maybe a max ceiling of maybe around 12,000 meters, although I'm going to be honest, you'll be hard-pressed to reach that height consistently, um, especially on like a single Juno engine, but even on twin Junos, getting to 12,000 meters at any sort of real speed will be a little tricksy. Uh, the Weasley, I think you can probably count on getting to uh, maybe as high as 18,000 meters before you run into real problems. It, it can deal with, with less air a little bit differently. I mean, you need more air intakes, but it's got more efficiency. It's also worth noting that both the Juno and the Weasley actually hit their maximum performance at a speed of a Mach of about 1.5. So at surface level, sound speed is what? 300 and change, 330. So when you're looking at about 450, 460, 470, um, so, sort of near sea level, that's when these engines are at their optimal uh, performance. Things change a little bit as your air changes. You can see here, my speed is uh, is dropping here. And in fact, our power, our thrust is dropping. 
and our air intake is dropping a little bit as we continue to we're, we're rising but we're losing speed so we're getting less and less air in here and at some point these engines probably won't have enough air after all you can actually close an air intake there's not usually a reason to do it in normal flight but as an example i'm going to close one so now we're only getting half as much air see see the prop requirement this is the uh, like propellant requirement, which might be fuel, but is also air. This is literally not getting enough air to use all of its power. Whereas if I open this air intake now, we're back at 100%. At some point, even with both air intakes open, this number will drop below 100%. That means your engine isn't getting enough air. It's starting to choke and die. Um, and so that will be a sign that um, you're not going fast enough for the amount of air that's around. So the solution will, all, will either be find a way to keep up your speed or don't fly this high at all. Um, so yeah, that's that. You can you can steer, you can do this. Oh, one of the things we didn't talk about is landing. Oh, I am probably going to flip out and die here because I did to an extreme of a maneuver. I don't want to point straight up. Oh, my engine just died. Okay, just relit. But for a second there, because we weren't facing into the direction of our movement. There we go. The so prograde marker is the direction that we're moving in. Because we weren't facing the direction of our movement, there wasn't enough air being fed into the front of the intake, so the engine actually died temporarily. So I'm just going to dive down here to get a bunch more air, and that's going to be okay. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, landing. So, I mean, landing is... Well, I mean, you know, don't don't hit the ground too fast is basically it. Um, there is a really... <laughs> uh, so basically, as you get close to the land, and we're not anywhere near that, maybe I could um, let me revert to launch... We'll see if we can do a landing. But I'm going to tell you a really powerful pro tip. Instead of trying to land your plane, you know, like a real plane, just put a bunch of parachutes on it. When you want to land, kill your engines, deploy all your parachutes, and have your plane gently hit the ground. That's by far the easiest way to land a plane in Kerbal. By far. So, let's go ahead and I think we can pull up right around now. Woo! Oh, okay, I got it! I got it! I got it. It's fine. Mm. Um, you, you didn't see that. <laughs> Go. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna bring down the authority limiter on these things to be a little less extreme. And I think I'll need a little bit more forward location or forward direction first. Probably moving the wings a little further back would be a good idea for stability as well. Let me go up to maybe about 60. The amount of speed you need to take off will definitely vary on your plane's power shape and wait. Say I tried to overcorrect too much there. How did I how did I do like such perfect takeoffs and then just decide to like But this is going to happen a lot by the way. You are going to destroy more planes or you're going to kill more kerbals or or have to do more reverts doing airplanes than anything else in the game period. Still going to bring this down a bit here. I'll just try to be a bit more gentle on my takeoff. All right, pitch down. Nope, nope, no, nope, nope. There we go. Okay. Whoo. I think we were more stable when we were using the other engines. I think because this moved my center of weight a little further back. I think it's tripping things up. But I'm going to try to turn around here. I'm going to... Hang on. Lower my throttle. There we go. Now turn. Because I'm going to try to do a landing. But, yeah. Just put a bunch of parachutes on your plane. And... That's really the primary, the best way to land in Kerbal. So, uh, I'll kill my throttle completely, it's fine. You might still need a little bit of throttle right up until the last minute, but that's alright. Keep in mind, at a certain point, if your horizontal speed, like if your speed is too low, and there's not enough air going over your wings, your wings stop being wings, and they start being rocks. So, um, if you slow down too much before landing, you might suddenly just find yourself a rock that goes straight down and splats. So you want to maintain a certain amount of speed. Um, I don't remember what the maximum landing speed, the impact rating of your wheels are, uh, which would be nice to know because it would help you figure out your landing speed. But probably as long as we land under 50, we'll be fine. Even then, I'm not entirely sure. It'd be nice if there was a really flat area over here. I suppose I could uh, turn around. And remember, you're going to lose a lot of vertical, a lot of um, yeah, vertical speed, a lot of height when you are turning like this. Actually, we just killed just a ton of our speed in general. Let me go and light my engine again. Because right now we are a rock as opposed to a plane. There we go. Okay. Kill my engine once more. Should be okay. Where's the shadow? There it is. Always nice to do landings um, during the day. Because your shadow can be a really good uh, guide as to your height. Because it can be really hard to judge your height 
uh, in the game because your monitor, of course, is 2D, so you don't have depth perception. And this number here is a uh, height above sea level, which is fine here because we're mostly at sea level, but not entirely. So we're bleeding off a lot of speed. We don't want to burn off too much too fast because our, our wings will stall. But we will flare a little bit before landing, kill a little bit more speed. Oh, I was going to say, I was I was tilted a bit too much there. My, my tail hit. This wouldn't be a problem, I think, if we're still in the Juno layout. But because my tail is a little too long, that happened. Uh, but yeah, that's that's why you tend to land with parachutes here. If my tail wasn't as long, or if my landing gear was a little further back, then I wouldn't have to worry quite as much about slapping my rear end on the ground here. But both on takeoff and landing has been made much more complex by the fact that I was using that Weasley. But the Junos make my plane a little bit shorter, like right, right here, so there's a little less butt. But I could also move the landing gear back. I could also set them a little higher. The other thing to note is that the small landing gear here actually extends pretty far. Let's turn on the uh, center of mass. If your landing gear is too far back, then you can't really tip up too much. But if we did something like that, I know it looks a little goofy, but I think it's okay. Let's go and rotate this a little bit. There you go, so you get even more height out of there. Um, the retractable landing gear does actually um, steer as well. So you can use a retractable one up front. Oh, this would be a good time to show up something else uh, as well. So let's say we put a retractable landing gear up front. So not symmetry mode, snap on. Go and stick it there. The one on the front is probably is going to be too low. See that? It's too low compared to these. So what we can use is the move tool to click on this and actually move it up inside the plane. We can turn off snapping for more control. Sort of like this. So it's... Because uh, the plane's slightly tilted, actually. So it's a little hard to judge. But something kind of like that. You don't mind if the, uh, the front one's a little bit lower than the back, just because it gives you a bit of a better angle for your takeoff. Um, but there's that. I think these wheels, these are going to be too far back for the center of mass. So I'm going to, I'm going to move these forward as well. So something like that. Because again, if it's too far back, you have a hard time tipping up for your takeoff. Um, but you want it far enough so that you're going to be protected from a tail strike here. So I think that works. Uh, but the way you uh, uh, retract and extend your landing gear is with the G key. G for gear. So SAS on. SAS is still useful for planes. Um, it's not quite as important, um, but it will encourage Jebediah to mostly, you know, keep you a little bit more sturdy. It's really far from perfect, but it should do okay. Hopefully these will work. We're getting a fair bit of wobble here, but it's not too bad. Let's go and take off. There we go. And then hit G to retract the wheels, which looks awesome! Huh? Huh? So there we go. So you can use this to fly around. Again, just load it up with parachutes and and launch the parachutes when you want to land this by far this is what everyone does you just use parachutes to land your planes um because it's a million times easier you have to remember the kerbal space program is a spaceship simulator game not an airplane game uh the aerodynamic model is not the most accurate for or realistic for actual airplane stuff although it's it's pretty good um and you can get a mod called far which adds a lot more realism to it although it makes it much much harder to make functional planes um but an, in a real plane you have a lot more um control and instrumentation available to you for your landings you've got flaps which dramatically make it easier um and frankly required to do a lot of landings you've got a, a bunch of other mechanics so don't feel the need to like fly real for your planes because this is not a real plane simulator. If you want to do, you know, get yourself Microsoft Flight, Flight Simulator or X-Plane or something like that if you want to do real airplane landings. And Kerbal, just put a bunch of parachutes on here and when it's time to land, kill the throttle, get space to deploy your parachutes and just drift down nicely. Thanks for watching this episode. Hopefully you found it useful and I suspect the next one will indeed be a rendezvous with uh, with the rescue mission because there's still lots of people who want to see that. There is a tutorial built into the game but I think we can do better. Thanks for watching. See you next time.